Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Catherine Carlton. I'm Executive Director of Orchestras Canada, Orchestre Canada, and I'm coming you, to you today from Peterborough, Ontario, also known as Nogajiwanong, uh, the place at the end of the rapids. This land is the traditional territory of the Michisage Anishinaabe people, and we honor their long-term stewardship of the land, and we study their teachings on the care of the land moving forward. Very grateful to be here and to be here with you. I'd also like to thank the Ontario Trillium Foundation, which through its courageous belief in Orchestras Canada and our ability to deliver the Resilient Ontario Orchestras project, made a series of transformative engagements between skilled arts consultants and smaller budget orchestras and youth orchestras right across Ontario possible through their, their funding of our program. So thank you, Ontario Trillium Foundation. The project, as you know, uh, connected 23 orchestras with 21 consultants. And as we began to look at the pattern of projects that came forward, we realized that there were some great stories to be told and some great lessons to be learned from the engagements that happened. Our goal with this project was to provide organizations with the help they needed, but it was also to harvest some of the learnings from those uh, engagements, from those interventions, to share with uh, orchestras right across the country. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted. I want to do one other thing that I've done in other uh, Resilient Ontario Orchestra sessions, and that's to provide a visual description of myself, because you'll be hearing my voice from time to time, and we do this as a courtesy to people with low vision. So I'm a white woman in my late 50s. I now have very short silver hair uh, and glasses, and I'm wearing a blue shirt, and I'm in a room uh, with a lot of bookcases and books. Now I'd like to pass the torch to my colleague, Lauren Drew. Thanks, Catherine. Hi, everybody. I'm Lauren Drew. I'm Director of Member Services and Learning for OC. Um, my visual description, I'm a white woman in my 20s with long brown hair, black glasses, uh, and a black sweater. Behind me is a white wall with a green Trent University degree and a poster of the Ferry and Bridge. Um, I'm also very grateful to be joining from Nogajiwanan, Peterborough, on the Treaty and Traditional Territory of Anishinaabe. Anishinaabe. I'm grateful to live, work, and play here since I was a kid. Um, so just a few tech notes before we get started. Uh, please keep your video and audio muted throughout the session. Um, we are recording, so you'll have access to that recording a, a few hours or, or days after the session. Um, you can use the chat, so please use the chat for the Q&A portion uh, near the end of the session. Um, we'll be looking at those and, and keeping an eye on them so we can ask them through our speakers. Um, I've pasted in the chat some instructions to enable live closed captioning, um, so please check that out. Um, and again, the recording and resources from this session, including the PowerPoint um, and a, a sheet on key takeaways will be available to you in the coming weeks. Uh, so keep an eye on your email. So with that, over to Dane uh, to start presenting. Hi there, my name is Dane Bland. I'm so pleased to be presenting this session on authentic fundraising. Um, I will endeavor to do so as authentically as possible. Um, a visual description of myself, I am in my late 20s, I am a white man, I have a beard. Um, I am, uh, as we were engaging in the tech rehearsal uh, portion of our day, I was told that I'm in a very stark room. I have a completely white background. I am in a black sweater with a collared shirt. Um, I would also like to acknowledge, I am actually for my day job in New York City. And so I would like to acknowledge that I am on the ancestral and traditional territory of the Lenape Nation of New York State. Um, and in doing a little bit of reading and learning about the nation, I learned that New York also has the largest urban indigenous population in the continental United States. And so um, I am very pleased and honored to be joining you from that land. Um, a very quick introduction of myself. Uh, before I talk for the next half an hour or so, um, I wanna introduce myself. Uh, and after that half an hour talk, I'm going to be joined by some incredible colleagues from Whispering River Music, uh, who I was so pleased to work with as part of the Resilient Orchestras project. And we'll share some learnings together, um, as well as sort of sharing some top line learnings, uh, you know, with each other beforehand. 
Um, so my name is Dane. I am a certified fundraising executive, uh, which means that someone somewhere believes that I should have a certificate for fundraising. Um, haha on them. I bring 10 years of nonprofit experience. Uh, I am additionally a uh, specialist consultant for small organizations. I bring a lot of expertise in small organizational fundraising. Um, and over the course of my career, I have been a part of raising over $25 million for various different organizations. But enough about me. We're here to talk about fundraising and specifically fundraising for small, mid-sized, and perhaps even large um, orchestras and, and musical organizations across the province of Ontario and perhaps even Canada. And so I am extremely uh, pleased to be sharing with you some insights. I hope they are of value to you. Uh, more than anything, though, um, we will certainly have a lot of time for questions uh, at the end of the conversation, but I want to build in a two-way conversation throughout. So if you like what I'm saying, if you think what I'm saying is really dumb, if something resonates with you and, and inspires uh, you know, a, a really fantastic opinion, please share it in the chat. Um, I can see those things as they come through, and I would be so pleased to engage with you throughout the duration of this presentation. Let's make this a two-way conversation, even though like solid 60% of it is going to be me talking, and I apologize in advance. So this is a little bit about what we're going to cover. We're going to co cover where the heck do we start, where do we look, I'm going to cover some tips and tricks for success. I'm going to cover some traps and pitfalls to avoid. We're going to spend quite a bit of time talking with our friends at Whispering River Music about their project um, and how they have applied some of these strategies to what I'm so pleased to say is some really great success so far. We'll finish off with a few important things to remember and then, as I said, build lots of time for your questions. So before we get going, there's a poll. We'll see if this works. Uh, Lauren, the, the magic through the magic of technology, is going to ask where you are in your fundraising. So this is so helpful. Do you have no idea where to start? Do you have no time to do it, but you try when you can? You've got some success, but you're looking to grow, build consistency, you know, develop. Or are you just a pro and you're curious, you're going to sit here and judge what I have to say? We've got the poll on screen. We'll keep it open for about 20 more seconds. That's great. We have fantastic participation, my goodness. All right. Last 10 seconds or so to get your response in. Look at this. Look at you all go. Like almost everyone <laughs> has participated. I'm so overjoyed. Okay. I'm going to close the poll and share the results. So I'm, so, I'm, on your screen. I'm so nervous there is a pro in the room. Oh my goodness, very, very nervous about that. Um, but this is really great. So a lot of you have had some, some really great early success and a few folks are really early stage and that's great. The, this, this I, I wanna share um, for the pro in the room, uh, I'm sorry, but this presentation is uh, geared a lot more to some of the people who are at earlier stages or looking to develop, you know, what's next? Where do we go from here? And so I'm really excited that, that you're all identifying some of these great opportunities because um, I, I hope to share some tips and tricks with you about them. And then the, I've got a second poll question here. Um, I want to know, so this is a multiple choice question. You can pick any and all. I want to know, what are you doing to fundraise right now? Um, any of these, all of these, none of these, um, I'm, I'm extremely curious as to what you're using to develop some revenue at the moment. So the poll is open, responses are coming in. I'll give it another 25 seconds or so. Thank you all for participating so enthusiastically. Oh, what an engaged crowd we've got. All right, last 10 seconds to get in your response. Okay, I will share the results. So this is very interesting. So almost every single person who answered, as I kind of suspected, Almost every single person who uh, answered said that they use grants and proposals um, as fun. 94% of people talked about grants and proposals. Um, an additional 65% of people talked about corporate sponsorship. 
Um, with great love to all of you doing this, these are the two most risky um, and potentially uh, least sustainable methods of fundraising over the course of you know, a period of a decade or more. Grants and proposals are often at risk for, as we all know very well, um, grants and, and proposals are increasingly oversubscribed with very limited budget increases and are at the whims really of, of, of the government of the day, perhaps, or of whoever's managing the company, if you're talking about company. And corporate sponsorship, all it takes is a budget cut or a change of employer or employment um, for the person who's your contact, and that unfortunately can evaporate. So not to sh scare you, but I'm glad to see that we've got some really great opportunities to grow and develop our individual giving and alternative fundraising strategies. That's really exciting because that's the core of this presentation is how do you build some more durability, predictability, sustainability, and broad-based support for your organizations. This is exactly what we're talking about. Super pleased about that. Even though maybe I scared you now, I, I promise I didn't mean to do that. So the, these are some sort of core, this is what, when you say fundraising, this is what springs to people's mind. Fundraising is all of these things. It's raising money through different tactics and tools. But I wanna to talk to sort of usurp our expectations just for a second. Fundraising is by definition, a long-term organizational activity that various charity organizations do to build resources, relationships, and capacity, not just revenue, but volunteer hours, committee volunteers, connections, in-kind services, all kinds of different things. Fundraising is a way of actually building strategy for your organization broadly. Um, success of fundraising can help to determine how much education uh, we offer in, in our communities. What kind of programming that we're able to offer? Do we focus on preservation? Do we provide, do we sub-grant to other smaller organizations in our community? Where you're successful in fundraising can help to dictate what kind of strategy you build for your organization. It most certainly talks a lot about how you communicate with the people inside and outside of your organization, the stakeholders of your organization. Fundraising is a brilliant way to inform those communications. They don't all have to be about asking for money, but they can be impact focused, focused on building and deepening relationships uh, with the idea of driving more and more people to be willing to support you. Fundraising is good data management. Oh my gosh. The number of organizations, some organizations, I worked for an organization that raised $7.5 million a year that managed its data on a series of Excel spreadsheets. Ah, oh my goodness. And it was a real barrier to our success. So absolutely fundraising is good data management. Fundraising involves processing donations appropriately, making sure that you, you cash the checks as soon as possible and you issue tax receipts as soon as possible. That is a really key part of fundraising. The most important part of fundraising is saying thank you. Fundraising can also look like volunteerism or any kind of giving of any combination of time, talent, and or treasure, the three T's. Um, some of you may have heard that before. And of course, fundraising more than anything else is anything that helps bring in money or resources. Okay, so let's assume now we all kind of know where it is. But now we're going to get into a little bit of why you're here. Where do you start? How do you begin to provide fundraising alignment or even get going? There was a, there were a few people in the chat that said they were super early stage. They didn't really have an idea of where to start or they kind of started but were a little stuck. But there are some things that are true no matter where you at in your in, in your fundraising. These are true for $25 million, $50 million organizations, and they're true for organizations with operating budgets of $25,000 too. No matter where you are in your fundraising, to be successful, you must have organizational alignment in the role that fundraising is going to play in your operations. That means that the staff, as much as they're capable, have to determine what kind of fundraising they're going to do, where, when, why, and how. The board of the organization has to buy that fundraising is a really important value added uh, tactic for the organization. And you have to build stakeholder alignment too. Your supporters have to be okay with 
you asking them for money. And there are ways to do that, but you can't just start willy nilly sending out a whole bunch of a million emails asking for money, or you're gonna have nobody left to open your emails really soon. So you must have top to bottom stakeholder, internal and external organizational alignment. The fundraising is something not just that is important to our organization, but something that we have to do to build success and sustainability. I also want to make mention, I'm going to say this a few times, this is not something that's going to be fixed. Your fundraising program cannot be fixed um, and it cannot necessarily provide immediate pinch budget emergency support overnight. To build a durable, lasting and reliable fundraising program, it's going to take time. And so that can be side of desk time. I'm not saying you got to dedicate 40 hours a week. And I'm not saying that you have to have an entire staff person on your team, because probably almost none of you do um, have an entire staff person on your team who's 100% wholly dedicated only to fundraising. You know, some of these people might do marketing or social media or events. Um, but what it will do is dedicating as much time as you can without sacrificing everything else to fundraising as an effort because what that's going to do is build consistency. If you know you're spending, even if it's five hours a week, if you just sit down at your desk one hour every day and do something to develop your organization's resources, to build an exciting relationship, to liaise with a donor, to say thank you to someone, that consistent effort will pay off. I absolutely promise you. Um, there's an adage, and I think I cover it later on, but there's an adage that says it takes between seven to 11 purpose driven and purpose built communications to drive somebody to make their first donation to your organization. Um, once you've got those seven to 11 and you've done that successfully, it can just take one or two to get them to give again. But to get them to give the first time, it can take seven to 11 purpose driven, purpose built and strategic communications to get somebody onboarded and ready to make a donation. So as you can see, that takes consistency. You're not going to shove seven emails into a single day. That could take six, seven, eight months before they're ready to step up and support your organization. I also, there's a real adage, it costs, it, it, you know, you have to spend money to make money. And in fundraising, that's true. But it doesn't need to be a ton. You know, a really good metric that many organizations use, um, it's one that I use, is between 25 and 30 cents spent to every dollar that you raise. Um, is a really good and helpful metric to use. But making money does mean investing a little bit of money up front. Um, that means you might need to invest in a database if you're large enough and you've got a few hundred donors where it's worthwhile to really track them appropriately. Maybe you want to invest in email or marketing software. Maybe you want to invest in, in doing a fundraising event, or maybe you want to invest in sending out a piece of mail to every single person you've got a good address for to inspire them to give. Uh, by the way, you do want to do that but 30% of revenue at this sort of, at this early level is still being driven, 30 to 40% is still being driven through the mail. So you do wanna send mail, but it does cost money to send that piece of mail. And the last thing is over long, extremely long periods of time, we're talking 30 years of organizational sustainability, building a strong, impressive individual donor program flow gifts from human beings to your organization is greater than or more important than everything else. It really is. I know that, you know, as we saw in that fundraising, many of our organizations are built on grant funding. Many of our organizations are built on the generosity of some fantastic corporate donors who can move the needle with one sort of stroke of the pen with a big check. But I promise you, building a sustainable, engaged individual donor base is going to be so much more important, you know, 20 years from now, you're going to wish you did that instead of, you know, spent more time writing grants. I, I really, really to find, you know, new grant funding. I promise you, I really do. So let's make a list together. Um, I want to hear a little bit about, so we shared how we're fundraising generally, but maybe we can use the chat function, put a list of all the ways you're fundraising that you think are really, really working for you. So what do you got going on that you think's working for you? Uh, a place where you're making money, the effort is successful and it's manageable and you wanna keep doing it long-term. What are some of the ways that you really, you're like, oh yeah, this is great. We're crushing it here. I'd, I'd be curious to see.
Who's gonna break the ice? Somebody's gotta break the ice. France. Okay, all right. Anne's, Anne's proven me wrong. An annual orchestra crawl. I love that. Wendy, MailChimp, that's great. MailChimp's a fantastic tool, especially for early stage fundraisings. Board members reaching out to their rich friends. Heck yeah, absolutely. Person-to-person -person outreach. A pretty consistent group of individual donors. That's awesome. Keep bringing, bringing those on. A used book sale or silent auctions at gala concerts. That's great. And Giving Tuesday. That's brilliant. Giving Tuesday is a really good excuse to reach out to people. A Christmas donation mail campaign and a campaign with our subscriptions. Megan, that's awesome. Um, Christmas is a great time to do annual fundraising appeals. I love donor letters with a brochure. That's awesome. Uh, Brenda, beer can and bottle drive. I love that. We're going to hear more about that one later. Um, Hugh, you're right. Grants are so much work in applications where you could you could be reaching out, but they do work. They work. That's why we're doing it. But we're talking about some other stuff. Board contacts is huge. That's great. Uh, a pre-calendar year end and uh, matching donations. Oh, awesome. This is great. You all have some fantastic ideas. I hope write some of these down if you're like, oh, we should do that. We should think about that. That's really awesome. Okay, so now really the meat of the presentation, why you're here. We want some tips and tricks to early stage fundraising success. I'm gonna say this a few times, and this is one of the things I've got, um, by the way, um, the chat transcript is gonna be shared after the session, that's awesome. Um, I also have a, a document, I think, which we're gonna send out to all of the attendees that sort of top line some of these tips and tricks. So don't feel like you've gotta take a whole whack ton of notes uh, either. Um, the most important thing that you can do is to remember where your bread is buttered. Um, so a lot of, especially in early stage fundraising programs, the, you know, you, you go, oh, we've got only 50 donors, but we need 150 more. So you're going to go on and on and on about acquiring new supporters, and you're going to forget the 50 people that have been giving to you all along. Um, and that includes corporate supporters. Don't get me wrong. That includes our corporate support. It includes our board members. Remember where your bread is buttered. It's buttered at home. So always spend the time to renew and thank the people you've already got. First, do it now and do it first every single time because it is much, much easier to add people into a bucket that doesn't have leaks in it. So if you get 50 new donors every single year, but you lose 45, well, then you're only ever really gaining five donors at a time. And that's no way to build sustainability. Um, uh, it costs, uh, on average, about 30 cents to the dollar, as we talked about, to renew a donor. But it can cost upwards of $1.20 for every dollar you raise to acquire a new donor because of all of the effort if you include staff time and everything else. So really, please remember where your bread's buttered. Um, for the donor, this is an important frame of reference. I do this too as a fundraiser. Um, a donor writes me a really big, fantastic check. And I go, oh, it's amazing. And I cash the check and I forget about it. For that donor, their journey begun with the signing of that check. And so their journey will be a very short one with the organization if the journey goes as far as them getting their tax receipt in the mail. The donor journey begins with the thank you. If you're having trouble renewing your donors, if you're like, gosh, we're spending 70 cents to renew every donor, it's because you're missing out on a really key core strategic part of the thank you process. If you're going, why can't we keep our supporters giving? The first most important and significant place you need to look is how you're stewarding them because that's where the problem is probably lying. If you're having trouble with any part of your giving program, the best place to start is with fixing what you've got going on and saying thank you to your donors. And I'm not saying you've got to go big. I'm not saying you've got to spend thousands of dollars on merchandise. A personal thank you, a handwritten note, consistently communicating with them, firing off an email, asking about their kids. It's the, you know, it's so simple. And that leads me into my next and most important tip. I'm going to say this a million times. And if you take one thing away from this presentation, it is that you cannot raise money in any vehicle if you do not build relationships. Relationship management and relationship building is, is at its core what fundraising is. And that includes with grant 
grant officers who are reviewing your application and who are helping coach you to success. That includes to the corporate uh, representative that you work with at whatever corporation it is that continues to uh, provide funds for your organization long-term. And it most certainly includes individual and recurring donors. There are, you know, robots don't grant money, people do. Robots don't give away corporate money, people do. And so skill and, and focus on, on analyzing fundraising as a really key and core facet of relationship building. Gosh, that's the most important thing. Please, if you take one thing away from today, take that one. And this is the other part of what you came here for. Where the heck do I start looking? Okay, so I've got some success. You know, we're getting grant money. Where the heck else can I start to look? Dane, you're talking about all of these other fundraising strategies. I have no idea. Well, of course, as we've talked about current and past donors and studies have shown it's not just, you know, the people who gave to you yesterday and the year before donors from up to the last five years will actually think of themselves as donors to your organization. So if someone made a donation to you, that's we're reaching now as far back as the end of 2016, like a Christmas donor to your 2016 campaign, there's a really solid chance that, that person still self identifies as a donor to your organization which is great and we should love and celebrate them. But of course we need to get them back in the fold because 2016's revenue has been spent 17,000 times over already. But communicating with them, when you do ask them for money, don't say, oh, make your donation or rejoin us. It's renew your support. Your past support of our organization has been so incredibly important. It continues to make a difference and we need you again this year. You know, we need you to, to be, you're such a valued part of our supporter organ and the support of our organization. We need you to come back into the fold. So talk to them like they are currently giving to you because they think they are, and we should celebrate them as such. Another great place to look. If people, if you've got audience members that you know, oh, we're putting up a concert and the, the Johnsons and the Smiths um, and the Muhammads, they're going to come every single time that their families, you know, their entire families are going to come every single time. Those people are primed to make a donation because they're already spending money with your organization. They think of themselves as your supporters, so they might be willing to give again and a little bit more. Um, another great place to look. The alumni of your pro, if you run an education program, or if you've got sort of a, a really great, oh, there's some good questions coming in. Um, I'm going to get to that one. Um, I'm going to get to that one, Leanne, in just a sec. Um, oopsie. Tech difficulties here. I'm clicking on things that I shouldn't be clicking on. Um, uh, alumni of your programs and of your education. Um, a lot of people in the chat said, oh, we're mining our board members. Um, families and friends, yes. The families and friends of your senior volunteers or parents or youth participants of your or like the parents of youth participants of your organization, they're really great places to look. If you've got like a business in your community or, or there's a wealthy, you know, uh, especially if you're in a small community, if you're in a big city, it's a little harder, but I like to call it playing the need em, got em game. Um, you identify five or six people in your community who are known philanthropists or who are, you know, your competition across the, you know, across the, the other side of the city, the, the other big orchestra in town, you look at their sponsor list and you envy, you're like, gosh, how do we get the local Canadian tire franchise to give? I guarantee someone who cares and is passionate about your organization knows the owner of that franchise. And so I like to play the Needham Gotham game. Network mining is really important. Community members. Um, reaching out to the general community in as many ways as possible and in as many ways as you can afford. Advertising, media, events, community drives, advocacy, stand, you know, talking at your local city council, standing up for the arts, building partnerships with other organizations that do different kind of artwork, you know, like partner with your local art gallery and combine an exhibition with a classical music uh, ex uh, expose. What an amazing idea building partnerships. These are great ways to get exposure bucks, which lead to real bucks. Um, and one thing I will say is uh, a, a really underutilized resource, especially if you're in a smaller community that's really uh, bullied by local media, spend some time learning how to write a really decent press release, because I guarantee your local media outlets are looking for things to include in the local news. And there's I mean, don't write a press release every single time, you know, 
every single time you do anything. But if you're doing an event or an expose or a major drive or something really exciting, write a press release for it and build a media list in your local community because you get free coverage, especially on slower news days. My only advice is don't send them at Friday at 4 p.m. That's my only advice. Okay, show me the money. So now that we found all the people, we know where they are. What are some really important things that are really important places to look for for some large donations? Okay, so we've got the small donations. Where do we look for for the large ones? One, an adage that I like to stick to is that individual capacity is often, not always, but very often a factor of 10. For example, if someone called me right now on the phone and convinced me to give them $100 um, and I pull out my credit card and put $100 down, hypothetically, I'd be capable, maybe it's over a year, I'm not saying I've got $1,000 to give right at this moment, but maybe I could give 80, it's $83.33 a month to give $1,000 a year. That sounds really doable for me. So uh, someone's factor of, uh, of giving is, is hypothetically about a factor of 10. Um, and so really think about that. When someone gives you 50 bucks, they could be giving you 500. Someone gives you $1,000, they could be giving you $10,000. So you have to make them willing to do it. They might be capable, but you've got to make them willing. Um, sector granting bodies. Yeah, these are big, big, big pockets of money, um, especially if you're already in. If you're trying to break in, it's gosh, is it ever hard? And I'm, I don't need to tell you all on the call how hard it is to get new money from an existing granting body. But if you're already in, yeah, keep it up because that's really important. That's it's really critical and key funding. But some other places to look, rather than sort of cold submitting um, things to major corporate dollars, look at your local business community, your business improvement association, if you've got one in your community and local community granting bodies. Um, where do your volunteers, members, and alumni work? Not just companies, but sectors, because that shows some sector support, which is really interesting. If everyone on your board's an accountant, maybe you should reach out to accounting firms. Um, municipalities, your municipality, and I'm, again, I'm sure most of you are, are really familiar. Um, municipalities are really important, and local business owners who are sitting in your audience who love your work, you never know what they'd be willing to give. Um, I'm going to take a second to take a look at some questions here. Um, what are some key components um, to successfully create a volunteer recruitment and retention program? Uh, Leanne, that's a really good question. I think one of the things I would sort of say is it's the same principles as we're talking about here with fundraising. Um, utilizing the opportunity to, to take a moment to just appreciate your volunteers and what they give to your organization is key. There are a lot of really great sort of national days of recognition for volunteer appreciation. Doing an annual volunteer appreciation event it doesn't have to be a big role at the Red Carpet Gala. It can be some tea um, and it can be some pastries. If it's done authentically and enthusiastically, you have to mean it. Um, getting to know your volunteers as people and as human beings and what what turns their cranks outside of your organization and then using that to help deepen their engagement. It's really simple, just get to know them, build relationships with these people and then treat them as valuable and integral resources because I assure you, you know, the people who rip your tickets and who come and do all of that, if they all disappeared tomorrow, we'd be in real trouble because those are, those are positions we don't necessarily have to pay for. Um, and it would be helpful uh, if you're talking about a legacy program um, and for legacy giving, some really great um, resources, and we will address. Um, we will address. Okay, we're uncomfortable asking for gifts. We'll address that a little bit. Um, there are other ways to help that don't just involve asking for donations. Plan giving is a hard one, and that's a bit more of a, of a of a stepped up resource. Let's see if we can come back to that one in just a second. So, thanks for the questions. Definitely keep them coming. So, here's some traps and pitfalls. These are some time suckers. Um, cold proposals. If you don't have an in, if you haven't been invited, if you just sort of went on TD Bank's website and clicked on their apply for money and sent in an application, it's probably 95% of the time not going to happen. If you really need that TD money, the best way to think to, to get around that time suck is who do I know that might be connected to TD? Who might be connected? Do I know people at the local branch who could recommend my organization to the central sort of outfit for sponsorship and recognition, who might be able to make an introduction to the regional sponsorship officer 
well, all of a sudden it's a war proposal and they're really going to pay attention when you hit submit because you've engaged them. Just cold submitting things that, and, and as someone mentioned in the chat earlier, it takes a lot of work to write a proposal. And if you're writing a cold proposal, that's, that's a really, really, really hard road to take. And I guarantee your time would be better spent focused on individuals. Um, time suckers, big businesses that don't necessarily have headquarters in your community that give um, that give sort of more nationally or provincially or regionally. Um, instead, think this is a really great way to reframe your thinking. Um, I'll, I'll keep on with the bank example. It might be really hard to get the central office of TD Bank to give, but local branches have community sponsorship dollars allocated to them. You might not get $100,000, but you could very easily get a few thousand dollars from the local branch or the local franchise of that organization that's run by a passionate community member who knows what it is that you're trying to do. So just reframe your thinking a little bit. You want money from TD, that's great. It's really hard to get central money from TD. It's really not hard to get money from the branch if you know the person there. Another, like people are always asked, where else do I look? A very common usual suspects, car dealerships are great. Real estate branches or even individual real estate agents are great. Accounting firms, trades, so often forgot about trade firms, uh, lawyers, they're really great places to look, especially if they're locally owned, locally franchised, or locally managed. Um, another time suck is big community philanthropists. If you're from a small town, you know there's there's the one person in your community who makes large donations that everyone knows. But if they don't regularly give to music or to arts, if their passion is the environment or mental health, it's going to be really hard to sort of say, well, they should be giving to us as well. I don't disagree. They absolutely should be giving to you, but they might not. And so instead, instead think that needum godum type thing. Who are you already one degree of separation from that all it would take is someone who's connected to your organization and their mission to make a warm introduction for you to facilitate a really strong conversation? Um, we talked a little bit, we talked a lot about over-reliance and stuff. These are limited pools of money that are oversubscribed. Again, I'm gonna reiterate, don't give up when this doesn't go your way first. It, it probably won't, it might, but it probably won't all work out at first. Um, I want to talk about a little bit about, um, and we've, we've mentioned this a few times, about big versus sustainable donations. I'd pause it, which is more valuable over time? A $5,000 donation once right now or 50 $100 donors over the next 12 months. Now, many of our organizations, and I, I, I empathize very deeply, that many of you might be in emergency situations where you're like, I need the five grand now, Dave. I don't care if I don't get it again, I need the five grand now. And to that, I say, take it, do it, make the thing happen, because you need that emergency funding just to keep your organization afloat. But if you're in a, if you're in a slightly more sustainable position than that, I posit that it is extremely valuable to invest in recruiting $50, $100 donors over the next year. Um, I had a donor at a place that I worked at who sent in $20 in a little envelope, $20 in cash. He was a senior gentleman and he sent it in every single year, one single $20 bill with a lovely handwritten note. And we were very nice to this gentleman because he was alone in the world um, and he sent in his $20 and he literally would scrape together money from his couch cushions to pull together that 20 bucks every single year at a hospital organization I worked at. Um, and he was a lonely gentleman and we treated him very nicely. Um, and he volunteered. Um, when he passed away, he left, uh, this is a hospital in Scarborough. When I passed away, he left his house to us. Well, you all know how much Toronto real estate is worth. We sold, the house was sold for $800,000. There's a wing in the hospital named after this gentleman who, while he was alive, could only rub together $20 at a time, but he had a home. He owned his home since the 1950s. And so when he passed away, he left the house to us and it was worth $800,000. So I guarantee you that your one $5,000 donation once right now is not going to turn into $800,000, but $1,500 donors could, they really could. Um, the thing nobody tells you, um, it's not in raising funds. Raising funds is, the, um, is what happens, it's the consequence. The, the effort you're putting in, the work is in building relationships. Raising funds is a consequence of that work. Um, a, a helpful tip or trick is to recognize that 
Most people have a three to six week mindset for your organization, maximum of eight weeks. So if they don't hear from you or see something from you every eight weeks or even less, they're probably going to start to forget about you. That's a really helpful way to sort of start to build communications consistency. It's also important that when and if we can to make strategic asks that have that are, are important and, and resonate with the donor rather than just constantly asking for emergency funds, because after a while that paints a stark picture of what your organization is. It's going to turn people off from investing. So even if it's hard, ask when it is strategic to do so. Um, and when the donor is going to be inspired to give instead of like, oh, gosh, we need $50 right now um, as much as you can. And I understand that for small organization, it's not always possible. So just try and strike a balance if you can. Um, so I would love to invite my colleagues from Whispering River, Brenda and Zach. So we spent some time together. Oopsie. Um, Brenda, Zach and I, an incredible volunteer organization um, group at Whispering River. Um, spent some time with us through the uh, early part of the Resilient Orchestras project, um, where we applied some of these learnings and they had some fantastic successes. And I actually, I wanna share, before I, I, I pass it over to them, I wanna share something that made me, can you all see that their website right now? Are we showing this? Look at this. Oh my God, when I went onto their website, and there's this join our mailing list pop out, which is brand new. It's something that they put together since we've had our engagement together. And they've, uh, oh, we were talking, was talking with Brenda and Zach yesterday. They get one or two new emails, uh, you know, a week, which doesn't sound like much, but over a year, that makes a difference. And that those are new contacts that they get to ask money for. And they've simplified and streamlined their website. So, I can look here and know exactly what they've got going for them, including a fantastic little support us page. Oh, what a fantastic success. And it, and that little, I, when I went back on their website after the completion of our contract um, and I, I saw that mailing list pop out, just want to say how much I just about fell out of my chair. What a fantastic new success. Um, it's so great. And they have some other successes that they want to share with you as well. So I'm going to pass it over to them for the next, you know, seven or eight minutes or so. Thank you so much, Dane. Really appreciate it. Um, I'll start. I I'm Zach Louch. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm a white male. I'm 29 years old. I'm sitting in a fairly plain room, but you can see I've got this nice picture of a dock here, which is where I wish I was sitting at the moment, with a drink in hand. Um, that's, that's myself. I am coming to you from Perry Sound, which is traditional Anishinaabek territory. Um, some of my relatives actually grew up in Henvey Inlet, just outside of the town of Perry Sound here. So I'm very rooted here and very proud to be coming to you from Anishinaabek territory today. And he is Métis. Come on. I am, a, I am Métis, that's right. I am Métis. I am learning more and more every day about my heritage here. <laughs> Brenda, tell and us who am, you are. And I am Brenda Muller, and I'm the Artistic Director of the organization. And I am actually, I'm finding that black vest isn't showing up. So I am, I have long grayish blonde hair, and um, I have uh, a red, reddish, orange uh, shirt on and I am talking to you also from uh, from Perry Sound and I am not Métis but I carry a First Nation name which I was honored to be given which is Red Sky Thunder Woman and I have worked very closely we have all worked very closely for the last four years um, with an elder from from our area and with <laughs> more than one elder we've run everything from language classes and all sorts of things long before it was fashionable to do so or required and I sat down with the elder and some other elders and we talked about land acknowledgements and I promised Lauren I'd share this with you um, many of our clients are First Nation or partially First Nation or are descended from First Nation in some way there are a couple of big arguments around here one is that you can't define a First Nation person just because um, the government says it can only be to two generations. So, uh, well, what's officially First Nation? If you have First Nation blood in you, you're First Nation. And that leaves to about 50% of Perry Sound is First Nation. So I'm going to read the land acknowledgement that we developed 
which doesn't talk so much about territories because we don't feel um, collectively that the territory issue was really what this is about. This is about mutual respect and what we've been calling two-eyed seeing. So here's what Marilyn and I wrote. Marilyn wrote, sorry, and I'm reading it. And uh, her name is Anish uh, Nibishkwe, which means water woman. She does a lot of work with the water walkers. Acknowledging lands and waters we call home. Acknowledging the lands and waters of the indigenous nations before us, we are humbled to imagine the gentle wake of the canoes and the blade of the paddles gently and gracefully marking the waters. Using the lands in a good way, leaving only a soft footprint on the land and caring for the gifts she provides. Wind and trees working in unison, still singing the songs today as in the hundreds of years past. We acknowledge these sacred gifts of Mother Earth in our local territories of the Indigenous peoples. And they um, work with us quite closely and uh, we have programs that go beyond the land acknowledgement. I always feel like crying when I read this thing because I really am grateful. I am grateful because when I came here, they made me welcome um, when I moved here from the city and they once again, miigwetch my friends, <laughs> you have been so good to me. Okay, so that's my land acknowledgement. And I am on the shores of the Seguin River, which is still a traditional hunting ground for the First Nations, and they still have rights over it. Um, so what, where do we go from there, Dane? <laughs> um, we have, we wanted to talk about some of the things that we've done. And um, uh, Dane, Dane has already mentioned the website. Um, we have really been strong and one of the reasons we were so pleased with Dane is that we've been strong from the beginning on building relationships with the community. I've always felt that a musician, as artistic director, that a musician's job is to serve the community. It's, we're, we're very humble folk, really. We're, it's not about frontal presentation. It's about how we as performers connect with the audience, especially in a place like this, <laughs> especially anywhere. But this is not about commercial uh, a commercial performance that it's about perfection. This is a community thing which together we empower each other by performing and listening deeply to each other. So when Dane came and started to talk about authentic fundraising, I went, wow, this guy's on to something. Because I know from many years of trying to market orchestras to get an audience out, what matters is how many friends the people in the orchestra can bring out really ultimately and that's nothing to be ashamed of and your circle will grow but you know if you don't get people locally out you're, you're really in trouble so um, we we did a number of things that that uh, we needed to improve on as a result of Dane, Dane's comment one of them was a letter we've just put together a letter of seniors who are writing our thank you letters um, both Zach and I are working for the organization and we just don't have enough hours to, um, to write all those letters ourselves. So we have three people who are going to start meeting um, and have already, in fact, some of them have already started meeting and they meet once a week and they are going to be writing letters of thank you, just handwritten letters that they're going to mail out. So I wanted to tell you that. The first, the first most important fundraising thing we did was probably our our letter of appeal that Dane helped us write. Um, it's a fantastic letter because again, it appeals to that authentic sense of our connection with, with the community. It's what you've done for us. And you know what? When all the other organizations went away all during the pandemic, we were here. And that's what really mattered. And he played on that and people came through and we raised $7,000 just from one single letter. For us, that's huge. But probably one of the sneakiest things was one of our most unlikely um, campaigns, which was run by a local trapper and, and fire captain named Linda. And Linda started her beer bottle and, and uh, can drive. But the great thing is that Linda has relationships with everybody in the community. 
Linda talks to people. Linda runs, um, used to work at the, the town recycling facility, the dump, and they, um, they were really incredible. Um, she was incredible. She went out, she talked to all the local marinas. We have now this advertise the most unusual advertising uh, feature, which is that we are, we don't have billboards, but in every dump, we have a box that says support educational program, support music lessons for kids through Whispering River Orchestra. It's brilliant. Everybody knows about us. Mind you, half, our, half of our students, and we have nearly 300 over the, when you add them all together, are on scholarship, but everybody knows about us because they put their beer cans and bottles into our box at the dump and in the marina and everywhere else under the sun. So it really was a multi-function thing. We were all skeptical at first because it's so labor intensive, um, but Linda did the work and she proved to us that she was absolutely great with that. And... Um, that's what it took is that personal, again, that personal connection. Yeah. Um, um, going out, if I can just add on that, Brenda, um, the yeah. beer bottle drive was a really good uh, representation of what Dane says and that it, it does take time. It's not something that just happens right away. It's, it's not like Linda put out these boxes and we were getting bottles and bottles and bottles right off the bat. It, this has been an ongoing process for over a year now, maybe even two that Linda has been doing this. Um, and, and 15,000, that's right. And now we're up to $15,000 that we've raised because over time people started noticing these bottles. They started checking out the website that was on the boxes. And now like the other day I went out to help Linda and her garage is absolutely stacked floor to roof with just bottles because everyone in the community now is just saving their bottles and cans for us. Um, so that's been a really amazing thing that over time has developed from, you know, a couple of dollars in the first couple of months to truly $15,000 that we've raised now, just from, from empties, which if anybody has ever returned to empties, that's a lot of empties, <laughs> you know? And, so. and it, it also builds on, 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 okay, so then that made our letter writing campaign more successful too, because Everybody knew that we had been here, that we were doing concerts. We built an outdoor stage. So even when COVID was closed down, we made a partnership with the Foley Fairground and we built this outdoor stage. And we did, we rented a tent, the oldest tent they had from a tent rental place. And we had this old stage that we had stolen from Mark Youth Theater many, many years ago and had been sitting, sitting in somebody's barn. And we started putting on concerts. And you know what? People had heard about them at the beer bottle drive. So it was, it was really quite successful. But from Dane's, with Dane's work, we were able to turn that very labor intensive thing into something that was actually much smarter as far as getting, getting money quickly, but still building on the relationships that Linda had established. So I thought that was a, a cool thing that we did. Yeah, um, it was good. We also, go ahead, Zach. Uh, I was just gonna add to that. Um... One, one really big success for me was we were, again, through Linda and her connections, Linda being a trapper, she travels all around um, our, our community here. Um, I had a cellist. She, she, she's a, also a cellist, yes. She happens to work for somebody who does work or who has an in for a multi-billion dollar corporation. You know, there's some, some big cottages out here, big money, land, and she happens to trap on one of these, 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 uh, these lands. And she said to me, you know, I know this guy and I don't really know how to approach him. You know, this question comes up, not everyone's necessarily comfortable asking for donations. I personally was pretty nervous to think that, okay, we've got this guy who has lots and lots of money. How do you even approach him? Um, he was talking to Linda one day the beer bottle drive came up, I believe is what it was at the dump, uh, said, hey, what's this organization that you're doing this thing for? One thing leads to another. And she says, oh, I've got this guy that would love to talk to you. I get this guy's phone number. We have a conversation. And I just used one of Dane's tips and tricks, which is just being yourself, being personal and using your own story. I just talked about how I grew up here. I, I really love this organization and how much work goes into it, how much it means to the community. And all of a sudden, this guy that I was really nervous to talk to, because I know he's got lots of money, is asking me more questions and how he can help and what money gets used for, et cetera, et cetera. 
long story short, the other day I got off the phone with them and he's, he's getting ready to send a large chunk of money to us. I don't know exactly how much, but I asked him for $10,000 and he didn't, didn't bat an eyelash. He's very excited <laughs> to donate a large chunk of money to our organization to help his community. And really that just started because one person that we knew, knew one person, and then I was a little bit friendly with this one person and oh, wow, well, now we've got this huge donation coming in. Um, so that was just a, a massive success that really just led from somebody knowing somebody and somebody being friendly with somebody. Zach, I'm going to interject again now. Another success that we had was, and it's in the process of being a success, is that Dane had advised us very strongly to approach local businesses, as you heard, and he's absolutely right about that. It's hopeless, uh, not hopeless. I once got a grant from Alcan many years ago, but I don't think it would ever happen again. Um, but it's much better to approach local businesses regularly and, and see what we can do. So we have a gal who I've helped out with music lessons since she was 14, who's now studying music, studying voice in, in at Wilfrid Laurier. And her father drives for the local bus company. So we went to see the bus company and we talked to him and we started a lot of stuff and I, we got all excited we thought he was going to give us a lot of money and he did give us he gave us five hundred dollars but we decided that what we would do is turn that five hundred dollars into an annual scholarship so it would become a sustainable donation of five hundred dollars every year and we're going to try to convince him okay we're going to we we happen to know that he's interested in helping special needs kids so we're going to use it as a donation for several people that we teach who are special needs kids and um, try to get that going uh, every year. So he'll sponsor one this year and two next year and we're just going to keep asking because that's the other thing that Dane keeps saying is that five, uh, if they give 500, they're capable of giving 500,000. So we're working on it. <laughs> Uh, I'm conscious of time. That's This is so awesome. Yeah. Uh, but I do want to be respectful of everyone's time. So um, I think we've got time maybe. I, I'll quickly say, if you hear from Brendan and Zach, there were a couple of questions in the chat that I think we can address. Like, what happens if someone is afraid to ask for money? Well, one thing that they can do is help to build relationships or make introductions. And someone from your organization can do the asking. Or they can help to say thank you, because that's so important. We heard about senior letter writing and stuff. Um, we don't have time to post key takeaways in the chat, but I would love to invite maybe one or two very quickly questions and comments from, from, from the crowd. And alternatively, what I can offer, because we've run just a little over time with everything going on, um, is you can find me. My name is Dane Bland, as I said. Um, find me on LinkedIn. Um, and my email, I believe, is included on the little the key takeaway document. I'd be happy to chat with you and answer some of your questions after the fact. If you've got questions for Whispering River, I can put you in touch with Brenda and Zach as well. But maybe we can do like one now, um, I think. Um, how do you find out names of donors from Canada Helps? Ellen, um, that's really great. The, you can download reports um, from Canada Helps. I think if you, I think the email is help at canadahelps.org and they can walk you through how to do that or there's a tutorial available online. Um, but you have to have, have, have a, yeah, you have to have a login. And if you don't have a login, but your organization's registered, they're such a fantastic organization. Just give their customer service line a call and they'll help you out um, to get access to that information. They're really, really great. But that's important um, to know who's giving to you through Canada Helps. The problem is they don't always put their snail mail address on there. And uh, that's a weakness we're kind of working with on them. Uh, one, a person who's not here, Katya, has been trying to figure out how to get always their snail mail address. People yeah. who give money are sometimes shy to let other people know they did it. So they don't really want you to know where they are. And, and maybe I'll, I'll end, Leanne, you, you put something really great there in the chat. Maybe I'll end with that and then pass it back over to our great hosts. Um, once you understand the reasons, like you are passionate about what you do um, and what you believe and, and, and the organizations you work for. And a simple thing to say about fundraising is that it is simply just sharing that passion personally and, and meaningfully and authentically with somebody else. And all you've got to do to fundraise successfully is to say, would you mind helping us out with that at the end of telling your story and your personal connection? Because I guarantee you are your organization's best salespeople. And so I'll pass it back over. Thank you for having me. I'm grateful for it. I'll pass it back over to Catherine and Lauren. Great. 
Thank you, Brenda. Thank you, Zach. Uh, thank you, Dane, for uh, a presentation and really a tale of transformation. Uh, the work that Whispering River does is so distinctive, so unique, so, so heartfelt and community committed. Uh, and, you know, transforming the work you're doing into a, a story to tell the community. Uh, you know, I, I've got goosebumps and I'm, I'm really grateful for <laughs> the storytelling. I'm also really thrilled at the kind of connection that you were able to make with Dane and the coaching that he was able to do. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm just really, really thrilled with this. Uh, just to remind you uh, that materials from this session will be found on our website in the coming weeks. We are running Resilient Ontario Orchestra sessions between every Wednesday from 12 noon to 1 p.m. Eastern uh, between now and the 8th of December. Uh, please do sign up if you're interested in finding out what's coming out uh, next. Uh, Lauren's posted some links in the chat. And I will ask once again, you may find this tremendously boring. We love it, however, to hear from you, to get your impressions of the individual sessions. We read what you're sending in and we are using it to uh, think about the future of this program and other offerings at Orchestras Canada. Uh, once again, uh, thank you to our speakers. Thank you to our participants today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. And uh, here's to great health, success, and inspired music making in the days to come. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, bye -bye. everyone.